Yeah, I guess it's pot. Yeah. And and who's sharing the screen? <laughs> well, we can do that too. Hang on. Thank okay. <laughs> uh, it'll be the Stevensons tonight. We'll be sharing. I, I still have not figured out how to get all of that squared away on my computer. I will if you're, um, figure out the privacy setting. <laughs> if you're looking wow. to be entertained and you have BritBox, there's a I, program called Vienna Blood. Okay. And, um, it's a uh, it involves an Orthodox Jewish family. The uh, one of the stars is a in that family a Jewish psychiatrist who has just started to follow. Um, pulling my mind out of memory, um, Freud who just started to follow Freud. Okay. And people looked you know sort of looked down upon him as a nutcase because he <laughs> was a follower of Freud. Uh, but it's a good program, and it talks a lot about um, Orthodox uh, Judaism. Oh, that's also three seasons. Yeah. So if you want to, are, are we um, picking up where we left off? I think we should. Yeah. Okay, so last week we did Yud, so we would start with Kuf. Yeah, I, would, I think we right. should start with Kuf. We ended up with Yud, right? Right. And we ended with the idea that God uses 10 to eradicate evil. I love that. Yeah. Okay, so cuff is a container. So if you look, actually, if you look at both uh, the top of the mountain and the shoreline, um, cuff is a container, a cup, think a kippa. It's a receptacle for holding. It's about a relationship of inner and outer within and without. So that's really important that, that you know, it's not that it's containing nothing, but it's this, that it contains, it holds and doesn't hold. Um, so cuff recognizes a crowning achievement to walk in God's ways is to love God, to do God's will, to cleave to God. So by performing acts of gimelut chasadim, loving kindness, we act in a God-like manner. So the idea is we walk, we walk up the mountain and raise ourselves up and God comes down and meets us and bestows blessings upon us. So it's kind of like we're all the receptacle at Mount Sinai. Um, Kaf is about raising ourselves up to find God hidden within. So if you also think about like Bet, that idea where God could come in, you know, and and the idea of, you know, we live in a world of duality, um, which isn't really duality. Kaf is that same idea. So it's about raising ourselves above our base desires or evil inclinations, again, through our thoughts, words, and actions. It's about striving to take the high road, to do what is right, even when it's not easy or popular. In our efforts to raise up, we prevail upon God to reveal the divine emanations to us and to come down and meet us. So again, it's also about that partnership. So we talked about with Chet, you know, the eighth day, you know, in the story creation, like, you know, we co-create. So again, it's about that partnership where, you know, or, or, Hey, when we talked about, you know, the hand of God comes down and, and we reach up. Um, so again, it's, it's another way of exploring that partnership um, and that, you know, God doesn't do it without us. Anything anybody wants to add? Okay, let's go to Lamed. Okay, wait a minute. I, oh, I was, you do have something I, you want to add. I, I was, was muted. I was muted and I didn't realize it. Okay, uh, in my in my in my word, I, I since I'm going to Israel soon in April, I like to look at what kaf means. So if you use the word kaf in Israel, it means a spoon, uh, and also kaf can mean the palm of the hand. So right. when I think of kaf, I look I look at the letter. And I always look at it as a receptacle of holding the divine force. Like Can you when go we back to your... priest, yeah, the priest, uh, you know, they, they bless with the hands, the palms of the hands. I would do a lot of energy things with Tai Chi and yoga with my, the palms. I release the energy through my hands, through, through the cough. So I, I always like looking at it as being a receptacle of God using the letter cough. Right, Tom? I see he's in the back there. Remember 
the old yes, days. Yes, Tom actually owns the cookies. I have, Tom, Tom owns I that one. Tom owns Yud. And remember last week when we were talking, and I said what I sh- like what I know now is that I put sort of the palm and cuff in the middle of the Yud, as opposed to the Yod in the middle of the Yud. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. So I, what you were just talking about in terms of that palm of the hand yeah. and the receptacle, that, you know, that's one of those where I would say if I was going back with a deeper understanding, I would, I would have done the pointy finger that's, you know, we saw in hay. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> so but that's all part of the, and, and, you know, yes, it's part of the learning process. It also to me shows how all of this is so deeply inner related and interconnected and the new, you know, there's so many nuances to it. So in a way, the middle of the yud here is, is another, is, is absolutely that, that receptacle that the rabbi is talking about. So I'll also show that, like, as you go, as we go through these and you talk about them, the growth and understanding, and the more you talk about it and talk about uh-huh. the possibilities, the more you understand it, and the more you understand it, the more you would probably, or I would enhance what, you know, or, or, or change or evolve. Exactly. What I was thinking. Yeah, I, I suspect if I were to do the series again. Yeah. Um, the letters like my interpret you know and I went back and studied and then went and asked please reveal to me the perfect symbol for each letter they'd be really different drawings you know partly because my understanding is different now than when I did them and I'm different now (laughs) and the energy would run through me in a different way and I do not recommend anybody do it the way that I did it because I did go kind of crazy. <laughs> Jennifer, why not, energy. why not come out with a volume two? That would be- It so was a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Um, uh, and currently yeah. I seem to be yes. working on a Chagall-esque series that has right, lots of angels in it. <laughs> but, you know, maybe someday. Well, we want, we really want a volume cool. two. Oh, you thank to- you. Uh, I'll I'll put that on my to do list. <laughs> we need so much. We need so much tomorrow the, expenses, list. the expenses. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you want to go to Lamed? Yeah. Okay. So Lamed. So if you think um, Lamud, learning. So Lamed is about learning purpose. Um, you know, Lamed in front of a word means to or toward. So you're learning towards something. You have a purpose towards something. Um, so if you kind of look, you can see like it's these arrows, you know, pointing on this path up to this whoosh of energy. Um, so our purpose is to learn in order to raise ourselves up to connect with the divine. And in order to really learn something, we have to learn it through all four levels of the world. So if you think back to our conversation about Dalit and the four worlds, If you really want to learn something, which means to really integrate it, then you need to learn it through the physical world, Atsilut, the emotional world, Bria, the mental world, Yetzira, and the spiritual world, Asiya. And if we don't learn something through all four levels, then we have not really learned it to our fullest capacity. That also relates to the... um, when we were talking about when we were talking about Vav, we talked about the eighth Hayam, and I told you about how the four worlds related to the ten Spiro. So, you know, you also have um, I don't have it on this. I'd have to go back and open up my book. So, you know, in that case, you're going to 
learn, you know, so the physical is malchut, and then, so the physical, which is, I'm going to I'm, I'm make sure I get this right, which is um, atzilut, relates to malchut, which is the physical world that we live in. And then the second bria is the emotional realm, and that's yesod, netzach, chod, teferet, um, chesed, and gevura. So those six spherot relate to the emotional realm. And then you have the third world, the mental world, yetzira, which is chokhma and bina. And remember, we talked about how Vav connects Malhut, the physical world that we live in, to Bina, the mental creation world that we live in. And then the fourth realm is, um, is Asiya, which is Keter, which will be interesting one week because that's like crown, you know, interesting when we get to the idea of um, Rish. You know, and that like whole headspace kind of thing. Um, so, what I what I also like about the idea of Lamed here is that uh, the it it really shows, and if you think about it, the path to learning is not a linear path. It's full of zigs and zags, um, and. What I also like about it is that Lamed has four um, four lines, you know. So the letter itself, like, hints at the four worlds. It hints at this jagged path towards learning. You know, it's not linear. Um, so there's there's that, and it it also like if you think about that, you know, a, as above, so below. And this idea of moving through the four worlds, um, you've got that like balance point, you know, of integration, which I think is, you know, that that circle mandala thing in the middle there. <laughs> that, you know, if you learn through the four worlds, then you've kind of learned through, you know, um, the whole chakra system, you know, you've embodied it, you've integrated it. And then it kind of, I, I would say that, that that star point in the middle is kind of like Malchut and the, that flash out at the top is like Keter. And it kind of connects through. Any thoughts, words? Any yeah. Thought on the Lamed. I always like the Lamed. I like what you said, Jen. But um, the Lamed, I, I love the shape of the Lamed here, and it, it's like the highest level, the highest letter that we have. So um, when the people of Israel were begging for a, a leader, and God said, I'm going to assign you a king, the letter reminds me of a, of a king, a king who's like the, the tallest of all, that's nobility, reaching, had to reach towards the heaven. So what was what was as we say limud learning? So what what was the requirement of a of a king? What did the king have to do? The king had to study limud. The king had to study Torah every day. That was a requirement. So if a king had to do it, what we're doing over here in this community, I love the fact that we could study every day together. That we are fulfilling what a king could do. Since we don't have a king, we try it ourselves. We all study ourselves together and. Certain nights we uh, and days we study uh, together. Sometimes it's by ourselves, but we always stress in this class the importance of the mood of studying. Yeah, and and I think you you hit on that idea that through that learning we raise ourselves up, we become taller. You know, so we, you know, and that idea of king to me connects both the the malchut at the bottom, that idea of sovereign with keter crown at the top. Yeah. You know, so, and, and Lamud, um, the Lamed Lamud is, is a pathway and a connection towards, 
towards the So shall we move to Mem? Right. Okay. Okay. Oh. Um, so if you think in yoga of cat and cow, <laughs> moo and meow, you know, you kind of got the the mem. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of those things that I love doing with little ones, you know, um, getting them to say moo and meow and, and you know, do, this is one of those where I love doing like the body, like, let's do mem. Um, because it kind of, to me, gives you that sense of movement um, that Mem is about. So Mem, you know, is completion and perfection. So in order to be complete, we need to surrender to the divine. And it's through this process of bending and bowing down that we're lifted up. So you've got that we're going to bend down to go up. Um, to surrender, you know, and, and through this lifting, you know, through the surrendering is where we're lifting. So it's about bending down in an act of reverence to God. And Mem calls us to acknowledge that we are not complete without God. And the only true relationship with God is one of surrender and reverence, right? So it encourages us to accept that there are so many things about God that we're never going to know and understand um but we don't have to to accept that god is so much more than we can ever understand right so it's kind of like um that i and oh this is interesting because i just noticed that mem is in negative space the way aleph is so when i said aleph was the only one i was wrong mem is also a negative space letter here and again it's that idea that you know the divine is so much more oh. than, than we can possibly understand and yet through that that kind of surrender um and and sort of that that bowing down the way we do when we you know in prayers when we're davening um that's what raises us up so we bow down to acknowledge that we don't know that we can't possibly know we and and it's voluntary god doesn't demand that we surrender it's it's our own bowing that's not submission and it's not subjugation. You know, we don't do it in fear. So when we surrender to the divine, we're acknowledging that we don't have all the answers and that our ideas are limited and that we're open to the possibility of all things supremely divine. So we turn our lives over to the divine saying, you know, in a way, kind of like, use me as an instrument um, to be of service. So Mem is about asking for that help and guidance. It says, like, direct me to do your will, God. Um, and, you know, you, you can probably think of the prayers where we, like, say those kinds of words, right? God, show me the way. And so by surrendering to our divine nature, we're born into a deeper spiritual connection with life, with God, with ourselves, with each other, with the world. And we remember that we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, but rather we're spiritual beings having a human experience. So we're raised up. So all of the abundance of divine source is available to us. So it's kind of like an infant in the womb, all of our needs are met and we are taken care of. So think, you know, Mem, think Mayam, think waters of life, Mayam, Chayam, you know, that that energy supports us. So Mem is about having faith that there's plenty for all. If everyone, think about this, if everyone actually acted from a place of true service, honoring all souls and the sanctity of life from this place of reverence and service, all of our needs would be met. Like there really are enough resources for everyone. If everyone had um, a pivotal mind shift. So Mem is about perspective. It's about attitude. It's about intention. And if we approach life from a place of scarcity and longing, then that's what we experience. If we approach life from an attitude of being of service and abundance, the universe reflects back to us and reflects that back to us. And we are the recipients of all that is good and abundant in the world. Um, 
And when I read that, I was reminded many years ago, I was with friends, I had friends who lived on a farm and I went to visit my friend and she was hanging up the laundry and she was talking about the scarcity of clothes pins because she couldn't find any and as soon as like all you know she had like had you know managed to like find just enough and then she like turned around and it turned out there was like this huge bucket of clothespins right behind her that she hadn't seen and to me like that's exactly like this moment of mem you know she was like and she like literally said oh I was living in a place of scarcity about the clothespins and I should have been living in a place of abundance um. <laughs> And that's kind of, you know, so if we're in that place of open to the idea that, you know, all of our needs are met and, and we are taken care of um, and that life is here too, you know, and, and the world and, and energy is all, however you want to describe it, is all here to support us. And we live from that place. We have a very different experience than one, if we're living in fear and there's not enough and everything is scarce. So that's kind of the idea of mem in a nutshell. I'm glad uh, you said something about the baby in the womb because yeah. the moment I look at the mem, it just, that's the first thing that came to my mind was the woman you know, holding in her womb the baby and I, I just thought of the beginning of life and how that you know that baby has all of this opportunity in front of it but right now depends on the mom for life mm -hmm. and that's the first thing you know I, I didn't even look at the negative space I didn't even look at you know the, the whole transcendence of what of what you were talking about you know scarcity and um and having more than enough so i'm glad that you just sort of brought that into it even though that that's not really what mm -hmm. m means but to me that's what i saw mm -hmm. well and you're saying that like made me think back to Aleph. So Aleph is all potential and possibility. And I'm thinking about the word truth. I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Emmet, you know, because I remember we ended a session um, with Tata. -ta, <laughs> right? And we were talking about Aleph, Mem, and Tav. And Mem is the halfway point in the alphabet and the Aleph bat. So, and, and so all of is this, you know, all potential and possibility and Sharon, you just kind of made us focus on, um, you know, mem as this, like, in a way, a beginning point of, of that energy kind of consolidating into a new life, you know, and then we'll get to Tuv where it's all about that transcendence and going back to Aleph so we're also getting you know as we did with Gimel that idea you know you're bringing in that idea of birth death and rebirth you, you um, mentioned the intention which we talk a lot about in Torah study yes it's our intention yes. when we do things when we read things what's the intention mm -hmm. um, I um, saw within this, not totally related to intention, but the first, my first sort of look at it was seeing the earth inside of us or the world inside of us. Yes. And then thinking we all have opportunity mm -hmm. and the world is open to all of us. Some of us have maybe more means than others. Maybe this to, to do it. Some have to fight oh, yeah. for it. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. give up, some don't. Right. Um, that's sort of what I see in this. Yes. Yes. So and and I think you're right. And and I think that's sort of the, you know, one of the messages of Mem is that it it is all there as a possibility. Um, you know, and, and you're kind of getting to that question of equality versus equity. Right. 
So, but if we, you know, if we came at life individually and collectively from a place where, from a place of equity, from a place of, you know, understanding that there is enough and, you know, then, then I think the world would be a very different place for all of us. And your comment about sort of the, you know, the world inside of us made me think of, you know, um, who was it, William, was it William Blake to hold the world in a grain of sand, um, that poem to, to hold the world in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour, I don't remember the rest of it, but it's that idea that, you know, I mean, even in the most minuscule um, thing, like a grain of sand holds, you know, sort of the secrets, you know, to the universe, which ties us right back into fractals. Yeah, back to fractals again. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I think I said last week, like, I think you begin to see how how it just kind of like it i'm beginning to like think of this um as as a kaleidoscope i mean the alphabet is like a kaleidoscope you know and it just sort of you know depending on the arrangement depends on what you see but the message really is a variation on the theme over and over and over again mm. It's just, where are you putting your focus? And that sort of takes us back to Dala, where it's like, where are you putting your focus? And, and you know, which world are you putting your focus on? And that's the world that you're aware of. So if you're, you know, thinking about, oh, I'm feeling cold or I'm hungry, um, you know, that's the physical world. If it's like, oh, I'm feeling really angry or happier, or, you know, I'm frustrated, or I love my wife, or I love my husband, or, you know, I'm concerned about somebody, you know, we're in the emotional world. You know, it's like, oh, I've got math homework to do, you know, um, you know, or I'm really trying to figure something out and learn something new. That's the mental world. You know, and then there's the, when we're davening, praying, when we're learning like this, you know, we're kind of in the mental world and um, the spiritual world, depending on where you put your focus, you know, so, but it's all there. So go to Nun. Uh, can I say something about the Absolutely, men? please do. For each one of us, uh, basically, based on your own life, I always liked the men because both my grandfathers, my mother and my father's side, were both Moshe. Moshe final, Moshe preferred them. But I think the lesson that I always learned from the men is that when we're looking at our redemption, the first uh, Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, who took us out of Egypt, was the first redeemer. And the final men is the Mashiach. Well, the final completion of the of the messianic year will be done by Mashiach and M. So it starts with a mem and I believe it ends with a mem. So that's what I think of the mem. Mm -hmm. And to me, that does relate back to that sense of completion. You know, you've got the redemption and then when Mashiach comes, we have more redemption and completion. Um, nun. Okay, so some people have a hard time seeing the nun. So it's the top blossom mm -hmm. down through the roots at the bottom. Okay. So nun represents emergence. So it's not fully bloomed, but it's not, you know, all underground um, it's like the buds beginning to open so nun reminds us that in this world we face challenges and adversities and you know we don't let them stop you know so the question is you know do you let them stop you or do you rise to the challenge so nun's emergence metaphor reminds us that the process towards integration and wholeness 
includes times of darkness. So oh. you have that kind of, you know, bet thing going, you know, sort of a yin yang, that duality idea. Um, so it also says that though there's times of darkness, you know, there's light within those times of darkness, um, which takes us back to the idea of Tet, where it only takes one spark to um, illuminate the dark. And so rather than being awful to be in the dark, we can think of these as times of richness when our unconscious is ripe with ideas. So, you know, when you think of, um, a, a, you know, you plant a seed and then it needs time to germinate. And so there's all the stuff going on underground before the plant finally emerges. So that's kind of the message of Nun is we need to dig deep into the darkness to find the gold. So Nun is the process of blossoming forth out of the darkness, out of disintegration towards a new life of growth and integration. In order to get to this point, many things need to happen along the way, right? So before a seed can grow and develop into a healthy plant, the ground must be fertile. It needs to be moist. It needs to be rich in nutrients. We have to dig deep into the dark soil to make a proper hole in which to plant our seeds. You know, if you think about this all as a metaphor for how we go from having an idea to taking action to developing it into a full blown whatever, right? So we have to then cover the seeds with dirt, fertilize the ground with extra nutrients to feed the seed, give it time to germinate, you know, sprinkle it with some water, make sure it gets enough light, right? There's a lot to do tending, it's, you know, and, and we're tending with a sense of faith because we're doing all of this, you know, not knowing for sure that the plant is going to grow, but we're having faith that it will. So Nun reminds us that everything contains some of its opposites. So though we may experience our world as separate from the divine and as an expression of that duality, we all contain some seed of divine essence within us. So, you know, B'Tselem Elohim, we're made in the image of God. Um, uh, also, I think of like the small still voice within, you know, right? So if we sit quietly, we, you know, um, settle in on our breath, you know, we connect to that deep space within us, you know, we sometimes if we're lucky, may be able to hear, you know, that small still voice within. So to raise our consciousness toward wholeness, we need to go down deep into the unconscious and shine a light to reveal, you know, like the gold that lurks in the shadows. And by bringing these things out front, we can examine them and make conscious choices. So the question becomes like, do we focus on the dark or do we focus on the light? And we need to consider what kinds of seeds are we planting in the world? What ideas do we nurture? What do we plant? You know, do we plant seeds of love, of unity, of equity, of creativity, of hope? Do we plant seeds that are destruction, conflict, fear? So again, the more we can move up in consciousness, we move out of that place of comfort, you know, yeah, we move out of a place of comfort. Like that's part of it is, you know, sometimes we're really comfortable in that sort of dark space, that place of fear, because that's what we know, that's what we're used to. So it's, can you move out of your comfort zone to grow into that place of trust that something better exists? And by engaging in that process of making the unconscious conscious, we create the container to hold our future self our future essence. So Nun again reminds us of that cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, and that concept that life endures. So by emerging, sprouting, blossoming, growing toward God, we in turn receive God's blessing upon us. Nun also has something to do with snake, but I don't quite remember what, but that's the snake seed down in the bottom there. But Rabbi, you could probably tell us. <laughs> Cool. I thought that was a worm to help the nourishment of the... Well, it is, but I also, I mean, yes, you can see it that way, 
but I do vaguely remember only I don't have it anywhere in any of my notes but I have the sense of snake for some reason well, not I could be wrong <laughs> so I, I don't think we're ever fully bloomed right well and we if should, you look we that flower bloom. is not we should always like, not be... yeah yeah I, I I agree you know it's something that we strive toward and if we do fully bloom <laughs> on something then what happens you know right right and then we're back in the process I, I think as a senior, that it's especially um, important for seniors to think that way. Yes. To not think that, to, to, think, to think that there's something new to learn and we should be learning new things to keep yes. us vital. Absolutely. I love this, that. This also draws me back to them because when you were talking about you know, you have the birth, you have the, the middle, and then you have the transcendence, and then you have rebirth. The same thing is true of a plant. Exactly. And the way that the roots are, are in, embedded both in the ground and in the water is <laughs> the same as the mem, where, where the baby is also, you know, embedded in, in water. And a plant always goes through birth growing and then it dies and it goes back to the soil and then it it's born again the following season well at least perennials are um but i just see such such similarities between the mem and the nun mm -hmm. but maybe i'm looking i might be looking at it weird but no i see, I see. I, I certainly can see what you're saying. And I love that you picked up on the fact that the roots do go into the water. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing I saw, actually. When I was going down the plant to see the nun, uh -huh. I, I noticed that the, the plant, you know, the, the roots went out of the circle mm -hmm. into the water. And I just thought, wow, that really reminds me of the man. You know, I was just making this. Mm -hmm. And and I think it goes to Arlene's point, although I think Arlene just stepped off, um, that that growth, the idea that growth is not contained, like there isn't an end to growth, right? So mm -hmm. to me, those roots also show that, you know, the growth doesn't stop. It can continue, you know, that's like a way of, you know, we can get out of our comfort zone, right? We can break through. We can grow our roots deeper which makes us stronger and more diverse. And humans, I mean, humans are always talking about going back to their roots. Mm. You know, they're using the same English word, mm. saying mm. they're going back to their roots of, of where their life began or their ancestors and not much different with plants. Yeah. No. Very cool. Good stuff. <laughs> so I just noticed it's like 2842. Do you want to do another letter? Do, you know, where do you want to go tonight? Yeah, I think we'll end with the nun since Arlene had to leave. I right. tell you, I, when I look at numbers, I always look at, I just have this mind for numbers. So I always look at the gamachia, the, gama, the, yes. the value of nun, which is 50. So when I think of the nun, every time I see the nun in the prayer book or in the uh, in the in the chumash when we're reading a, uh, a a sentence or we're praying, I just think of fifty, which is the fifty gates of understanding that God gave us in this world. So when I look at the, nun, I think of how much more time I have to study in order to attain a higher level of trying to know God to get to all fifty levels. With the time frame between Passover and Shavuot, there's a time count towards the receiving of the Torah. So each day we, I, I look at it, each day we have to look and see if we can grow and try to reach a higher level of understanding of God, which we were sort of when we left uh, Egypt until we were able to, to actually be capable of trying to hear the uh, giving of the Torah, the commandments by God. I, I, I love your numerical mind. I, I, yeah. I do. 
I, I love, I, I was just compelling when you, last week when you were doing the whole everything adds up to seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and I love that, that, that idea of, you know, I mean, obviously known as 50, I, I love Gematria, but I don't have that brain to remember it right now, but I might remember it in the future. Thanks to your statement about Pesach to Shavuot and counting the Omer and all, cause that makes sense to me. And I can, you know, see that in the nun as well and the 50 gates, so. But you know what I love about it, Jen? I love the fact that everyone looks at a letter and sees something differently. Exactly. Everyone for themselves. Your message is different than my message, and Jared, uh -huh. um, Dini, Dina, and Scott, and Marcy. Yes. Everyone's got a different uh, different uh, meaning. And, and, and you know, if it's meaningful to you, who's to say that it's wrong? It's just whatever's meaningful to you is the best way to relate to a letter. Since the letters we all know are divine and their heads exactly but everyone has their own message shared your message is different than the way i perceive it i don't expect to be in your shoes and sometimes you shouldn't be expected to be in my shoes everyone's got a different interpretation for their own life ah but has anyone thought what the nun means on the side of a dreidel <laughs> nothing nish nothing <laughs> 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 We just need to think that up, right? <laughs> <laughs> that Jen's been with us for so long. It's a nice. Thank you, Jen, for coming to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so next week, we'll start with Samach. <laughs> <laughs> and I will read it ahead of time. We should finish up the letters, Jen. I think, I think we can finish up the letters. So interesting. Oh, let's see this. <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say, Rabbi? I think we can finish it up next week with all the, with because there's only a few letters left that we can finish. There is Samach, Samach, I am Tov. That's we, seven. We've never done seven yet, but we can yeah. read through. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't have to, Jen. I just, I, I'm thankful that you're able to do. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, it's totally up to you. It's your class, obviously. <laughs> but you know, I'm happy doing it, you know, and stopping whenever you want to stop. Um, I'm happy trying to get through all seven that are left. I'm happy doing, you know, a couple more tonight, however you want to do it. It's, it's an honor to be with you. Well, I just say we should stop because Arlene is really right. interested. She's not here. Yeah. Yes. Please. All right. And, um, and and actually, I mean, you know, depending on how much conversation we have next week when we start, you know, there's there's a certain amount of, you know, like when I give this talk all at once, the last letters sometimes go really quickly in the sense that it's like, oh, remember back to this letter, remember back to that letter, you know, this is that letter projected into time and space kind of thing. Um, it, so that's the other thing is that the letters build on themselves. So they reach back and forwards. So we might be able to, you know, just whip our way through them next week. <laughs> <laughs> Run through the alphabet. You know, is, is there anyone else that's created a mandala book of the letters like you? I, 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 I don't think so. It seems, yeah. I mean, not, I, I don't think anybody has done it this way. You know, I mean, there's lots of books on the Isle of Bed and, you know, many of them I had included in the suggested reading, but I don't think anybody's done it the way that I did it. Unique. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Because you're taking like a Buddhist concept and you're making it Jewish, which is most people don't can't can't really do that and go change it over to make it a Jewish form, an art form from a Buddhist mm -hmm. form. Well, and I think it it really happened because I was you know going and doing these mandala classes, which I was really like doing for my own healing journey. Um, 
And, you know, I began to understand that, you know, this was just really archetypal. There's that word. I remembered it this week. Um, so it was very archetypal. And so, you know, it went beyond any one religion or idea, you know, and, and the way that, that we approached the drawing process was, you know, you just went in and asked to receive the perfect symbol for whatever your intention was. And then as we, you know, moved through this process and had these like six, you know, day retreats, you know, you covered a lot of other ground. And one of them was that, you know, this idea of mandala, this idea of circle shows up all over the place, you know, it shows up in nature, it shows up in the human body, it shows up in religion. Um, it shows up in the food we eat. I mean, it just, you know, this, this sense of oneness just kept being reflected back. And in other religions, it shows up really clearly in iconography. And it was when I said to her, um, when I said to Judith Cornell, you know, well, where, if you say it shows up everywhere, where does it show up in Judaism? You know, she was like stumped and she was like, I don't know, Jennifer, you have to go find that one. Uh, right. but, you know, but, but like on some level, she knew that it was there. And, and that, you know, when I thought about it, you know, when you like look at the, you know, sort of a traditional Passover, you know, Seder plate, you know, it's there when you think about you know, the, un, you know, traditional wedding ring is an unbroken circle. It's there. Um, you know, when, like, it, it was there. And then I learned about Shaviti, you know, and, and that idea, you know, of doing um, meditative, I'm just looking for my, I thought I had a second um, notebook here. Um, but the idea of Shibiti, you know, the meditation that takes you to the center, like that was the thing about mandalas was that they take you to the center. So whether you're starting at the center, like when you look at a circle, you know, even if you look at this one where the center is, you know, um, the center, you know, isn't specifically defined there, right? But even on this one, your eye goes to like right there, right? Whatever that blossom is, you know, in that place where the yellow and the purple meet, like right in the center, right? Your eye naturally kind of drifts there at some point, and then it drifts back to the outer circle. And so it's that, that idea that, you know, that kind of really drew me in. And then and then, and when I had said to her, you know, and she had responded, well, you have to go find it is like that statement back to me was the thing that drew me into doing, like, I needed to not just do mandalas, but to like figure out Jewish mandalas. Like I had to create my own idea of Shaviti. And I went to, um, I went and asked actually, do, do you, I'm, I'm, of course, you know, Adrian Durlester. Oh, of course. Adrian. Right? So, so Adrian was the religious school director, you know, at a religious school, you know, Sunday school that I was teaching at. And, and I went to him, um, I think, I think it was Adrian, it was either Adrian or Sonny Schnitzer, you know, they were both like the religious school directors. And, and I had like shown him some piece of art, you know, and he was like, oh, mandalas. And I was like, you know, mandalas. And he was <laughs> like, yes. And I was like, well, where are they in Judaism? And he said, and that's when he said to me, Shaviti Hashem la Negdi Tamid. That sounds wow. like Sonny was close to our, Adrian was never in that area. I right, right. Think. It was Sonny. Yes. Sunny. It, right. Yeah. Adrian was the one who told me that, that good enough is good enough. That was the lesson I learned from, from Adrian. Right. So it was Sunny who said, you know, um, Shaviti Hashem Lanegdi Tamid. Um, I see before, you know, everything before me, I, I see God in everything before me. That was how he translated it to me. And then he pulled out a notebook um, with uh, a Shaviti meditation, you know, which was prayers and names of God, all designed to take you in to yourself. In 
you know, deeper into the prayer. And that was the thing that like dove me into it. Yeah. But by the way, Jen, just so you know, when we finish the Hebrew letters, if it's this week or there's a, in two weeks, there's no class because I have my aunt is speaking in Shelton uh, about the Holocaust experience on Tuesday. But uh, after this, we plan on doing Shvitis. So, uh, so. And I'm, I'm sure I just heard you wrong. You plan on doing what? Shvitis. We're going to talk about Shvitis. Oh, Shvitis. Yes. Maybe you should all do your own. Yeah. I mean, that's the idea, but I want to first give an idea of how they're structured and you know, that. yes and i i know i actually have two oh i do have two notebooks here okay it's like yeah i mean this is this is yeah. one of them you know that has just like it's got what does it have it's got the yud hey vav hey um i think it has um Um, Adonai Sittati is here, you know, the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm like looking at it in the, but it's like all these different prayers. This one happens to have English also. Um, I have another one that I haven't been able to find that really was like totally circular. I actually have a metal one um, that was like imprinted. Um, and it's all in Hebrew and like the whole pattern takes you like straight into the center. And I think it had the Shema and the Via Hafta and I'm not sure what else at this point. Um, but yeah, you can definitely like, it's a fun project actually to like make your own. But yeah, so Jen, just so you know, after we this, we are, that's next on the next, cool. next album, so. That's awesome. I, yeah, so I, I like to do awesome things and you are uh, awesome. <laughs> I, <laughs> we have all those years when we were at the Spirituality Network of K. We had David Those Zeller. Good days. For us, David Zeller was so wonderful. Maybe <laughs> beautiful spiritual singing and yeah, but that whole thing. Yeah, it was fun. It was it was really good. Those were good times. And then we and then because of that, you can touch with Sharon. Did the ketuba for her? Well, that that was all you, sir. Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> Aaron, Rebel, Rebel is on there. Yeah, it's on there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I tell everybody who walks into this house, she never met Rebel. She was able to, she was able to put him on my ketubah and she never met him and it's exactly what he looked like. Well, he's green on your ketubah, however I remember correctly. <laughs> but he's still got the white collar. <laughs> And he's in Netzach. I just know he's in the lower right corner. That's right. He's in <laughs> Netzach. <laughs> but I hope There's the Lord... day when we meet in person. Yeah. So. Again, uh -huh. I will try to very carefully transport either my bat mitzvah certificate or my ketubah. Well, we can take both. <laughs> try to do that. We'll, we'll try to... We just transported a very expensive piece of art from Naples, Florida to Connecticut. Wow. Hopefully it's not broken. With like 10 to 10 stops in between. It was like, all right, where's the art? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where is it? Are the pillows on it? You know, I want to do that. You know what? I, when we're together here, I still think of uh, Sharon reading from Hazinu. It's like, it's like etched in my mind forever again. Wait, Sharon. Yes. Uh, Zina, I'm so proud of her. It just seems like it was mm -hmm. yet. <laughs> you know, I don't I do that, picture. right? Uh, I don't actually have a good picture of your YouTube, but I do have a good picture of your bat mitzvah certificate. I'll, I'll take a picture of the Ketuba for you and send it to you. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you. I mean, most of my art is your art anyway. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'm honored. <laughs> All right. I suppose this love fest sure. needs to come to an end. <laughs> so good, good to see good you. To see you. My Thank God. you. Thank you. Right. See you next week. Thank you. Glad you're home safe, Sharon. Bye. Bye-bye now. Bye. Bye.